Good evening. I'd like to call our meeting to order. I'll begin by calling on board member Christy Pratt to open us up. Could you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And could you remain standing for a moment of silence, please, also? Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you. We will begin tonight's meeting by remembering three students who passed away earlier this school year. Although we celebrate their lives and the positive impact they made on the Guilford County School family, our hearts are extended in grief to their loved ones. On behalf of the Board of Education, we'd like to extend our deepest condolences to the families, friends, and teachers of Wee Jazari Harper, and Ronald, Ronald Lee Snipes. Thank you. Wee Wai was a student at Gateway Education Center for 19 years, beginning as a preschooler. The last few years, we was a Gateway Gator as a home hospital student. His home hospital teacher consistently commented on the effort and engagement that he put forth in the activities that he presented. Even though he was an adult, Wee's personality was so captivating that his preschool teacher stayed in touch and visited when possible. Wee's family loved him deeply and loved spending time with him. Gateway will honor Wee's academic achievements at graduation in June 2023. Wee's life will be honored in the spring of 2023 at Gateway's annual memorial service. We will remain in our hearts forever. Zari Harper is a senior at Dudley High School, was an amazing young man with immense potential. An effectually smiles, beautiful smile, eloquent with his communication, a profound mind, a president that commanded a room, a natural born leader in his own right, two very supportive parents. He thought the world of his family and enjoyed spending time with them and friends. An aspiring artist and entrepreneur, the story left a legacy with us. Dudley High School was graced by his presence and we are so grateful for our time with him. Ronald Lee Snipes was a young man with an inspectious smile and cunning sense of humor. He had a deep love for his family and friends. Ronald Lee had a light that moves others. He had close relationships with his school social worker, Ms. Reeder, and assistant principal, Ms. Bracia. He was deeply missed. He is deeply missed by his friends and families, but his light was shine on through his sibling and warm memories from his Dudley High School family. Although, although we were only privileged to know these students for a brief amount of time, in their own ways, they helped to create heartwarming memories that will be cherished forever. To honor these students, please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. At this time, we would like to invite any family members or school representatives in attendance to come forward to receive condolences from the board.
this time I'd like to call uh, Pastor Frank Thomas to the podium. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board. Um, as we've just remembered students who have passed, we also um, were invited today um, for a moment of remembrance of the young children in High Point that were just killed. Um, I share with my congregation often that we all live in a Me Too world. I have stress, someone would say, me too. I have bills, me too. I'm happy sometimes, me too. I'm sad sometimes, me too. But as I was just sharing with uh, Reverend Brunson, one thing that gives me hope is that someone might say, I know Jesus, and someone will say, me too. I believe many in this room know him, honor him. And as we come today to remember those children, that entire family now um, that has been changed, the community that has been changed forever, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that um, Ms. Bellamy Small called me today and asked me to come and represent the High Point community because this happened in High Point. And many times, no fault of anyone, sometimes High Point feels like the redheaded stepchild when it comes to many Guilford County things. So I wanted to come today and share that the Minister's Conference of High Point and Vicinity, the faith community in High Point, the entire High Point community um, wants to rally around and wrap our arms around all those who have been affected, those children that will never see their classmates and don't understand why. Many of us as adults don't understand why, and because of how this all transpired, we may never know why. But we do know one who knows, and my question, my prayer, my plea to all of us is that we will always remember why we do what we do to educate and keep our children safe. And please know that when a child leaves a classroom, that doesn't mean they are out of our care. If you're a teacher, administrator, school board, we should love and care for those children always. And in these hard and difficult times, um, I want you as the school board to know that the faith community is likewise um, standing with you. I know this is a tough time for members and, and all those who work here at the headquarters. Um, so I, I, I stand today to pray that God will grant us peace. And more than that, I pray that he will give us comfort. And through that comfort and peace, maybe even peace beyond understanding, some things we may never understand in this life. But I believe one day, <laughs> the old folk used to say, I'll under we'll understand it better by and by, but I sometimes I wish by and by would hurry up, get here. So I don't know if it's appropriate. Is it all right if I pray now? I know, I know, I know, Madam Chair. That's why I ask. Um, I, I think of um, another person uh, who passed away or passed by away. Yeah. So. I understand. I understand. So I would ask all of you who know the words of prayer to pray and remember that prayer is just not in our audible words, but prayer ought to be in our hearts because, by the way, he knows our hearts even when our words don't match. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Thomas. Uh, we will certainly be remembering these students and their families uh, and their school community at a board member board meeting in the future. And thank you, Board Member Bellamy Small, for inviting Pastor Thomas to come in this moment to speak to the High Point community and what they are going through.
Um, next, we will recognize our January Employee of the Month, Amy Simpson. Will you please come to the podium? Great teachers are those that you remember for having a positive influence on your life. For one former Gibsonville Elementary student, that teacher was Amy Simpson. This was the person who named the January Guilford County School Employee of the Month. Now in the Army, the former student shared a photo and, a posted, and posted a message to the school's Facebook page wanting to let Simpson know that he was doing well and that she had a strong influence on his education. Principal Jessica Bone endorsed Simpson in her nomination, praising her for investing in her students and providing high quality science instruction. Students get excited about learning science in Mrs. Simpson's class, wrote Bon. She chairs our science committee, leads our school science fair, serves on our IPS committee aimed at tracking intervention data and provides highly engaging science instruction that is hands-on, standards aligned, and data driven. However, this student's post to our school Facebook is proof of the indelible mark she leaves on her diverse group of students for years after. These kinds of messages are why teachers teach. Simpson received a $50 gift card courtesy of the Greensboro JCs, and during the month of January, her photo will hang at the district central offices at Gibsonville Elementary and at the Greensboro JCs office. Amy is the second member of her family to receive employee of the month recognition. Her husband, Drew, who also teaches at Gibsonville Elementary, received the honor in January of 2020. What a family. At this time, I'd like to ask board member Linda Welburn to read aloud the certificate honoring Amy. Amy, thank you so much for your service, engaging teachers that are devoted to their topic and know it so well that they can engage these children, make a world of difference in their learning ability. Teachers do not understand the true impact of everything they do. Some things that you don't even know that you have done will change, a, impact a child drastically in a positive way. So I wanna thank you for your service and your dedication. Guilford County Board of Education Certificate of Recognition presented to Amy Simpson, Gibsonville Elementary for Employee of the Month. Jan January 2020, it is signed by our uh, superintendent, Whitney Oakley, and our chair, Dina Hayes, and I'll bring Thank you all. It's my passion to be a teacher, and um, this is a big year for me. My very first year at Gibsonville Elementary, I was a kindergarten teacher, and my seniors graduate this year from Eastern Guilford High School. So it's a very big year um, for me as an educator, and uh, I love the school I teach at, and um, I've been there um, for all of my career. And um, I'm just thankful that Guilford County Schools has been a place that I can truly work each day to fulfill my dream of being a teacher and being that person for students that um, I needed so badly as a student. So um, thank you so much. Thank you. And at this time, we would like to invite you, anyone uh, from the school or your family to come forward so we can congratulate you personally. Thank you.
We're now at public comments, and just as a reminder, you have three minutes to make your comments as you approach the podium, or when you get to the podium, we would like you to begin uh, with giving your name and address. Um, when you have 15 seconds left, an amber light uh, will blink, and when you ha your time is up, um, a beep and a red light will come on, and we ask that you wrap up your comments so that we're able to hear from all of the speakers who have signed up this evening. Um, we also ask that if you support what is being said, we would like you to demonstrate that support by doing this so that the speaker can continue uninterrupted and we can hear uh, their full comments. Uh, first on our list is Sherry Pikett, followed by Bill McNeil. Sherry Pikett, followed by Bill McNeil. Sherry Pikett? I'm sorry? Is that, is that wrong, how to say your name? Oh, Cherry. I said I Sherry three. Pikett. Is it Sherry? Cherry. 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 I thought you said Sharon. I'm sorry, okay. Cherry. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, Cherry Pikett, 7804 Robinson Road in Summerfield. Most of the social emotional learning curriculum being used in schools across the US is produced by a company called Castle Collaborative of Academic Social Emotional Learning. Our own Guilford County School is a recipient of this um, curriculum. Castle is all about transformative social emotional learning. But do parents know that in 1994, Castle was developed at the Fetzer Institute in which Fetzer claims each member of their team brings a unique spiritual and religious lens to the table. Marcus Elias is one of the founders of Fetzer. He is the so-called godfather of social emotional learning. Here is a portion of Fetzer's mission statement, that's Fetzer Institute. We believe in the possibility of a loving world a world where we understand we are all part of one human family and know our lives have purpose. We encourage each other to discover new ways of knowing our sacred world and explore our personal spiritual journeys as we work toward transformed communities and societies in which all people can flourish. Marxist Paulo Freire, who wrote, Pedagogy of the Oppressed and Politics of Education said this in his books, Policy, Politics of Education, page 105. The educator has to die, so to speak, as the exclusive educator of learners. The educator must propose to learners that they too die as learners. Without this mutual death and rebirth, education for freedom is impossible. The educator has to live the profound meaning of Easter. Those are his words. You may say that social emotional learning in school is not spiritual or religious. Then why are administrators and many educators so zealous to transform our children's hearts, minds, and bodies instead of teaching math and reading? Oh, but there is a law against teaching religion in a government-run school. The First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Have any of you sworn with your hand on a Bible to uphold the federal and state constitutional laws? And I have references here, thank you. Thank you. Next is Bill McNeil, followed by David Gleason. Uh, good afternoon. Good, good evening. Afternoon. I'm Bill McNeil. I live at 1014 Gretchen Lane in Greensboro. I'm here uh, on behalf of the Greensboro Solar Power Now Coalition. We've been following the work of the Joint Facilities Committee and the reports on construction activity, the construction budgets for the first schools under the $300 million bond program that the voters approved. We're glad to see some movement on that. I have some comments on it though. Uh, as a little bit of background, at our urging, 
Greensboro City Council set a goal of 100% renewable energy for all city operations. Just this past December, they adopted a strategic energy plan laying out how they're going to achieve that goal. We think that that model is one that could be followed by virtually every county, every city, every state, and I would suggest every school board. We urge you to set a similar goal. And by setting a clean energy goal for green schools for Guilford, uh, you give the staff and the design team uh, a, a, an emphasis to put on energy as they work uh, on all the details of all the school construction activity. We're concerned that energy may be subordinated to other cost considerations. And the other pressures that we've heard are on the, uh, the, the design team as they try to bring in the schools under a budget. We've heard the, the proposals. We followed the process. We heard Michelle Green talk about uh, using life cycle costs. That's a very good practice. It's one that we think will benefit looking at the life cycle costs of heating systems and AC systems that use uh, energy efficiency and solar looking at lifetime. It would benefit us and other citizens, though, who are concerned about the climate emergency to see the details of how energy measures are being considered in the design of the facilities and how they've been considered in the value engineering decisions that have been made. We raise this not just because we think it's a good idea, but to remind everyone of the board's 2005 policy that calls for enhancing the energy efficiency of all school facilities. That policy, as I think you know, needs updating. It needs to be updated and followed in all your activities, including the design of the uh, school facilities that are under consideration. If you haven't analyzed its details, we would suggest you look or have your staff look at the Inflation Reduction Act that has some significant um, incentives for using energy efficiency in the construction process. Thank you very much. We appreciate your consideration. Green Thank Schools you. for Guilford. Thank you. David Gleason followed by Michael Logan. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I live in North High Point, Jamestown. Uh, I'm a 25-year resident of Guilford County. Uh, my son's graduated from Southwest High School, so I'm very familiar with and followed the education system for some time. I'm here tonight as the chairman of the Guilford County Republican Party, and I wish to address the issue of the vacancy in District 3, which was created by Patrick Tillman's resignation. As you know, Patrick Tillman is a Republican. The Republican Party has been very diligent in following the process and procedures that dictate the statute of how a vacancy is filled. We have notified Ms. Wilson over here of our intent. We've also notified each of you members of the board. We submitted Michael Logan's recommendation in December for your approval. You did not fulfill your statutory obligation at that point for reasons that we don't know. We are now back tonight. We have resubmitted Michael Logan's recommendation, and we would hope that you would look favorably upon that and appoint him to the seat of District 3. We believe the statute is relatively clear. The GOP has the prerogative to nominate and recommend. We have done that. The school board has an obligation to fulfill your statutory obligation and appoint him. It's relatively simple. You have Michael Logan's recommendations before you. You have Michael Logan's letter of resignation when he is appointed to the board. You have precedent in how this vacancy has been filled previously. 
by Winston McGregor. There are no impediments to the appointment of Michael Logan. We would urge you tonight to appoint Michael Logan to the chair of District 3 so it can be represented. Guilford County Republican Party looks forward to seeing Michael Logan appointed tonight. We have no desire to have this issue continue. We have no desire to have a contentious relationship or issue with this board. We have no desire to have a fracas with this board. However, we have been very diligent in the process and we are committed to see that Michael Logan is appointed. So I would urge you to appoint him tonight. Do not force us into situations that neither of us want to do and no longer need to prolong this. So again, I urge you, put his picture up there on the board. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Allison Welch, followed by Jason Hicks. Oh, I'm sorry, Michael Logan, followed by Allison Welch. I'm sorry, Ms. Welch. Again. My name is Michael Logan. I live at 5202 Rambling Road, Greensboro, North Carolina, in District 3. I am the District 3 chair of the Republican Party for District 3. I have reviewed the video on Winston McGregor's appointment. There's a lot of inconsistencies between my appointment last time or my vote last time, because that's all it was, was a vote. There was no discussion. I want to know why you vote no. It is, I want to be fair. Now, on re watching the video, there was one thing that really stood out to me, because I watched the discussion. And I will say, Diane Bellamy Small, probably gave the best speech of all. And in it, she said, the candidate is qualified, has shown a desire, selected by the people. How dare you not respect democracy? We have followed the rules. We have followed it. 7.30 this morning, I was at my school cooking breakfast for my leadership team. Tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, I'll be at school with my students in my classroom, whether I'm paid as a teacher or I'm paid as a school board member. I'll still be there. Now, I have to ask school board members sitting up here, at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, which classroom will you be in till 4.30? Which students will you be helping tomorrow and doing it at your school board salary? So with that said, the voters of District 3 should be allowed representation. We will have gone 30 days without rep representation and I will be honest, I am here because of a book, because life is funny. And it's not very funny. That book should have been removed from the schools and District 3 should have had a voice in that. And anything else that comes up, District 3 should have a voice in that. I have offered to help with my students up until their exams which should be within the next two weeks as a school board member. I'm qualified. I have 25 years experience in the classroom. What else can you ask for? I have desire. I have attended more board meetings than probably most people sitting in this room. And not only for the public comments, I've sat here in the board meeting all the way till the end and provided y'all the respect of listening to y'all's comments. So I'm asking for your vote to place me in the seat. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Logan. Allison Welch followed by Jason Hicks.
Sorry, thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Allison Welch, 306 Hillside Drive, Greensboro. Um, I'm here this evening in my capacity as the director of the Family Literacy Program at Reading Connections, a small nonprofit with a 32-year history here in Guilford County. Our two-generation family literacy program impacts kindergarten readiness and emphasizes educating the whole family with a dual focus on preparing kinder, excuse me, preparing children from low-income and immigrant and refugee families for kindergarten and supporting parent and caregivers literacy development. We help break the cycle of illiteracy in Guilford County and promote positive educational outcomes for parents and children alike. I want to speak with you all today because I'm deeply concerned about our organization's ability to continue offering family literacy programming at Guilford County Title I elementary schools due to increased uh, GCS facility use cost amounting to as much as $16,000 for each of our 15-week program sites. We know that our program positively benefits GCS families from the refugee parent who develops skills to more confidently speak with her child's teachers, help her children with their homework, and promote positive and effective at-home literacy practices, to the preschooler who learns valuable classroom skills and is better prepared when he enters the kindergarten classroom, to the third grader who can work towards reading at grade level in a supportive environment with individualized attention. It's our hope that we can continue to work with Guilford County Schools to support Guilford County families and achieve GCS outcomes at the same time. Since 2006, Reading Connections has provided 47 family literacy program semesters in Guilford County, including 30 semesters at Guilford County Title I elementary schools. In our family literacy program, families participate in a community meal, parent and child together time, adult and child literacy instruction, and parent education. We choose Guilford County Schools for the majority of our program sites because we know the school is truly a trusted community space, especially among the immigrant and refugee families we serve. We have a long-standing relationship with Hunter Elementary in Greensboro and Oak Hill Elementary in High Point, and we are very much looking forward to offering programming at these two schools again, February through May of this year. But as it currently stands, we can't afford to do so uh, due to Guilford County Schools facility use costs and unfortunately our limited budget. Um, in September 2021, I attended a Zoom meeting hosted by the Greensboro Commission on the Status of Women, uh, where now Superintendent Oakley spoke about two-generation programming as a GCS strategy for creating strong post-secondary pathways. Reading Connections has proven success in this area and would really welcome the opp opportunity to truly partner with Guilford County Schools in the pursuit of this goal. We know that 73% of GCS children enter kindergarten lacking proficiency in early literacy skills. In light of this significant need and the success of our program, please consider waiving the facility use fees for our family literacy program. Thank you for your time and consideration. Um, and if I may, can I give you a quick handout? You can just hand it right okay. here and we'll right. make you. sure we get it. Thank you very much. Jason Hicks followed by Amy Harrison. Good evening, board. My name is Jason Hicks. Uh, as a resident and parent in District 6, I'd like to thank Ms. Irby on what I believe is a job well done. However, that's not the only reason I'm here tonight. Uh, I want to speak about the vacancy in District 3 as well. It's my belief that each seat on this board has the potential to impact every district and every student. Mr. Michael Logan has been put forth by his political party as a choice for that seat, which to me is alarming. A quick view of Mr. Logan's social media shows a clear pattern of violence. Mr. Logan once shared a video of a homeowner grabbing a shotgun to confront a thief. Mr. Logan says, quote, an assault shotgun at work, gotta love it, end quote. On another occasion, Mr. Logan says, quote, President Biden called on Americans to protest peace peacefully and follow the law following the jury's verdict in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial, which he said left him angry and concerned. Can Kyle get his gun back first? We saw how the peaceful protest worked last time, end quote. Uh, when referring to students who were pepper sprayed while performing a sit-in protest, Mr. Logan said, quote, 
should have used a bigger can of spray, end quote. These are only three of the many quotes which I took the liberty of taking screenshots of and emailing you, you all just before I came up here. My fear as a parent is that this same violent ideology would be used in decision making for our students. Will Mr. Logan choose violence and dis disagreements with each of you in this body? Will Mr. Logan try to push extreme and harsh pun punishments in regards to disciplinary actions? I'll leave you with one last quote from Mr. Logan, which makes me wonder if he wants this job or if this is just a stepping stone for other political aspirations. Again, when referring to students performing a sit-in protest, Mr. Logan said, quote, spray them all and let the parents sort them out, end quote. Thank you. Amy Harrison, followed by Jennifer Shaw. Hi, my name's Amy Harrison, and my address is 7385 Wood Springs Drive in Whitsitt, which is in District 4. I'm a special education teacher at Reedy Fork Elementary, also in District 4, and in my in, in and, and, am, and am in my 23rd year of service to the students of the state of North Carolina. I'd like to speak to you tonight about two things, the proposed calendars and teamwork. First, I would like to give you some feedback about the proposed calendars for the next three years. I understand the constraints placed on the calendar committee by the North Carolina General Assembly and hope that they change these rules to allow each school system to make a start and end dates that reflect the needs of the local communities, students, and staff. I would love for the semester to end before winter break so that exams could take place before the break. I know my third through fifth graders at my school have been having to take their interims this week and the next couple weeks to fit in and all during that testing window. And it was really hard to have my third graders take a test on Friday um, after being out for so long. I do like the calendars that give us a work day in February. Sometimes it seems like that 28 day month, which is the shortest one, is longer than any of the others because typically there aren't any work days scheduled. I know I need a day to catch up on all the paperwork, trainings, the letters, coursework, and the other things that are required. And I know my colleagues feel the same way. Secondly, I'd like to say I really like Dr. Oakley's theme, Better Together. It is very similar to a meeting norm of an organization that I'm very active in, in this together. To me, this means that we are stronger when we work together to achieve a goal and that we can always find common ground. In this case, that we are all here to make sure Guilford County Schools is the best place to work and learn. I'd rather look for what we have in common and build on that when what divides us. I hope I have the opportunity going forward to do this with each of you as we advocate for the schools and work sites we all deserve in Guilford County. I appreciate your time and service for the to the students and staff of Guilford County Schools. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Shaw followed by C.J. Brinson. Welcome. Good evening, Madam Chair, honorable members of the Guilford County School Board, our esteemed superintendent, and your excellent staff. My name is Jennifer Shaw. Uh, my address is 7928 Bayfield Lane in Greensboro. I've lived and worked in Guilford County for more than three decades, and I have two adult children who are graduates of Guilford County Schools. I want to begin by expressing my appreciation for your public service. Congratulations to those of you who are newly elected, and many thanks to those of you who've been serving previously. I appreciate that each of you has the best interest of all of our students in mind as you make decisions for Guilford County Schools, including your decision last month to make sure that additional members of the board need to actively affirm every child, regardless of their multiple identities. And I don't think that that's the case for Mr. Logan. I speak as the parent of two adult Guilford County Schools graduates who have gone on to successful advanced education and successful careers. My children are straight, white, non-disabled, and economically and socially advantaged. And during their time in Guilford County Schools, they were able to see themselves positively reflected in the curriculum, in the literature, in the history lessons, and in the images on the walls and in the books. They were surrounded by opportunities to see images of people like them reflected in success. My wish is that you will continue making progress toward a goal of having every child in Guilford County Schools have opportunities to see, 
to equal to what my children had. I want every child to be able to see themselves and their stories reflected in the history that's taught to them, in the stories in the books that they read, both in class and in the library, to see images of people who look like them on the walls and in the classrooms, and to learn of the contributions that others like them have made to our great country. As always, thank you for your service to our community. May you continue to strive to enhance and improve the opportunities for all of the children in Guilford County. Thank you. Thank you. C.J. Brenson, followed by our final speaker, John DeBeer. Good evening, uh, Madam Chair, um, Superintendent Oakley, members of the board. Uh, my name is Reverend C.J. Brinson, and I reside at 504 Garrell Street. I'm also the father of three students here in Guilford County, two at Moorhead Elementary, and also one of my children, they attend early college at Guilford. I want to thank you for this opportunity to publicly express my gratitude for your actions, not the seat, Mr. Logan, as representative of District 3. There is a precedent for your action, both on the school board and on other Guilford County policy-making bodies, such as the county commissioners. Membership has been rejected or challenged in the past by sitting members. It is important that this is known and that accepting a nomination or not is within your rights. And again, I say thank you to all of you. I am aware of the phone calls made to you and your staff expressing concern about Mr. Logan's anti-LGBTQ remarks and behaviors. It is within their rights to do so, and it is also in yours, uh, your rights to deny a person making such remarks uh, to have a seat on a governing body that should treat all students with respect and dignity. This board's decision affects all students, not a single district, and it is my belief that while each member represents their district, so do they also represent the district as a whole. These students deserve to be heard and they deserve to be represented by a caring and respectful adult individual. Mr. Logan has demonstrated neither care nor respect. Further, Mr. Logan's support of people and organizations working to end measures and attempting to create equity in our schools is particularly unacceptable to me. My three children being able to attend GCS was a long and hard fought uh, battle by my elders and ancestors. Their being welcomed and succeeding is a continuous fight within our community. It is with that I ask that you continue to consider and imagine how parents feel when they have to see on social media uh, one making racist and homophobic remarks and that same individual seeking membership on a board that governs the very schools my children attend. I ask that everyone imagine what is being modeled for white children, what is also the message being sent to children of color. I believe in safe schools and that includes students uh, being saved from being uh, denigrated or vilified for just being who they are. Again, I commend you for standing up for me and my children and for all others who seek peace and equity and for governing board that believes in serving all children. In the words of uh, Morehouse graduate and legendary filmmaker uh, Spike Lee, I want to ask you that you continue to find the courage to do the right thing. Thank you for allowing me to share. God bless you. Thank you. And our final speaker, John DeBeer. Madam Chair, members of the board, I, I'm here today uh, to thank you and to encourage you. Uh, I'm a, my name is John DeBeer. I'm a retired Episcopal priest, and I reside at 2905 Winwood Drive in Greensboro with my wife. I have an ongoing interest in the education of young and old alike, and see that education necessary as we, in this day, learn to be one nation under God with liberty and justice for all, without the establishment of any religion whatsoever. 
As I look back on what you have done as a school board, you have done the hard work of crafting a comprehensive plan for the long overdue physical improvement of our schools and enlisted the community support needed to fund this work. Thank you. You have continued to bring the best of yourselves to your work in the face of personal attacks and the threats of violence. Thank you. Tonight's agenda speaks volumes to the hard work that you are embracing in 2023. Thank you. In order to continue to do your best work, you deserve and you need to have a climate of mutual respect among your membership. We are in a deeply divided society and the children and teenagers in our schools carry the anxiety of this division in their bodies. I see this in my own grandchildren and the children of my friends. This anxiety makes learning difficult and is expressed in destructive behavior. We need a school board with widely diverse opinions held together by mutual respect among the members. This will help you play your part in reducing the anxiety in the school system as a whole and be able to work together even more effectively. I commend you for seeking this and I encourage Guilford County in which you live to make this possible. Best wishes for your work this year. Thank you. Thank you, and that concludes our public comment portion of our meeting. We are now at approval of the agenda. Is there a motion? Move the agenda for is there, tonight. Is there a second? Second. Uh, thank you. Uh, board member Deborah Knapper has been on the phone since the meeting started and is here now. So all members um, uh, vote by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we're now at the consideration of the District 3 vacancy. Uh, we'll ask our Attorney Wilson in just a moment, um, Ms. Welburn. Um, do you want to make your comment before Attorney yeah. Wilson? Yeah, nothing. Thank you. I mean, it's, um, we, I did vote for all the projects, okay? And a lot of those are very high in cost, many of them have doubled. And I know a part of that is a large situation, um, but we also had over 50 schools impacted by the freezing weather and rain. So I again want to emphasize that we have to have a major focus on our the, getting the deferred maintenance back where we need to be. It cannot be all about building new schools. We have to focus a large percentage. We got a lot of need out there. Those parents expect us to fill that need. And we cannot afford to have 50 schools go down. So I understand, I appreciate the work that's gone in here, but I also need a focus on the deferred maintenance. Thank you. Thank you. We haven't gotten to the consent agenda items oh. yet. Well, so that's okay. Well, that's all right. Okay. I already got it said. <laughs> okay. I, I couldn't figure out if it was about what, what always, Attorney Wilson was going to do or not. That's okay. I know. I know. I've added to that confusion. Attorney Wilson, if you will please say something about the process uh, again. I'm so happy to, board members. I realize we are in uh, yet, yet again, as you'll recall, when we um, dealt with this with the vacancy that was eventually filled by Winston McGregor, the process and the statute that we're dealing with, despite everyone telling you how clear and simple it is, isn't any of those things, unfortunately. The statute that actually controls what you're doing today is 2013 North Carolina Law 361. And section six deals with filling vacancies and it provides vacancies on the Guilford County Board of Education shall be filled by a vote of the majority of the remaining members present and voting for the remainder of the unexpired term. It requires you to vote to approve as elected officials to add a seat that would be served as somebody uh, in a board that is elected. 
it then goes on to say, Vac vacancies shall be filled as provided in GS 115C 37.1 paren D paren. So then we turn to that statute. 115C 37.1D actually is only a list of counties to which the statute on partisan elections applies. It does not have a method in it. It is simply a list of counties. Now, 115C 37.1 also has A, B, and C and they have various different methodologies for filling vacancies. Uh, and those include having, when there is a partisan election, which there is in this case, in other words, this is, a, the, the, Mr. Tillman was elected in a partisan election. He was in a district. And so the process, were we to have a statute that required us to follow 115C 37.1C would have said that the appointing authority must limit those from the appointment, in other words, the executive committee members of the Republican Party from District 3 would then participate in making the nomination to fill the vacancy. That's what 115C 37.1 provides but the language that precedes it in the statute requires the vote to be filled by a majority of the remaining members of the board present in voting. So it, it requires your vote. And you'll require with Ms. McGregor, in fact, I don't believe it was a unanimous vote um, any of the times that we had a vote because a majority of the board doesn't mean that you just automatically at a point, you must vote. So. That's your process. It is not clear. It could certainly be clearer than it is. I didn't draft it. I'm happy to report. Um, I do sometimes help draft legislation, but this is not one I drafted. So that's what the law actually requires. I'll welcome any questions you have, or you can proceed to your process. I, and I just wanted to just clarify that at the, and I said this to Mr. Logan as well, when he asked me to view the video from July 17th, 2018, which was the meeting where we were voting to fill uh, the at-large seat that was left vacant by our previous chair. And it went through this same process. The board voted, the vote failed for Ms. McGregor. It was four to four, so the motion to seat her failed until Ms. Bellamy Small asked for a recess um, and a board member changed their vote. So Ms. McGregor was not seated um, because she was recommended by the Democratic Party. She was seated because uh, the majority of the board voted the second time to seat her. So I just wanted to offer that as clarification. Ms. Bellamy Small. Well, when, when we, we wound up with a tie vote, um, I asked for reconsideration because there wasn't, uh, usually the reconsideration is, the prevailing side. There was no prevailing side. So I had as much of a, of a right to ask for reconsideration as the four who voted no. So then we went on break. So I just want to, you know, we, we did follow uh, Robert's rules and what we did. Okay. And the same process as tonight, as the exactly. county commissioners did nine, 11 months ago to fill the vacant seat of Carolyn Coleman as the city council did to fill the seat vacant by Michelle Kennedy and every other vacancy that um, has occurred within the governmental units in the 20 years that I have been here. So the, the process is the same. Well, so board as long members, as we you can think about it for a moment. The reason that I, I, I have to assume the reason that the legislators added the language that requires a majority vote is because you're accountable to the voters. A non-elected body is not accountable to anyone, but you, my friends, are accountable to the voters, and that's why a majority vote is required. So until we are, there's some statute that says no municipality or governmental entity has, um, you know, we do not have the right or the obligation or duty to vote, then we will vote. And so um, is there um, a motion for the consideration of the District 3 vacancy? Um, Can we get a motion in a second? I, I move that we um, put Michael Logan on the board. Okay, so to approve the recommendation. Yes. Okay, is there a second? Okay. Second. Okay, go ahead, Mrs. Wilburn. 
we have a 25 year career teacher sitting out in that audience. I, I saw people go through his Facebook and nitpick on a few things. All right, he is a conservative. He believes in the Second Amendment. All right, that, that is there. All right, he believes in people being able to protect themselves. All right, now, he's been in this district for 25 years. I want to know why he is not fired with these kind of comments being made about him. Why is this now a man still in our schools if he cannot separate? He has been such a um, 25 years, okay? I don't think he has any complaints in his personnel file. I don't, didn't, you know. So I also have seen this man go to volunteer stuff. Go put, I mean, everywhere I go, if there's some kind of thing, he's there cooking and he's there giving and he has stood right there and said, he will stay there for his students to finish the year, not on a salary. So I don't know how he got so awful. That's my point. I'm like, if he is this terrible of an individual and he is touting all this stuff in his classroom, why is he still there? So that would be my point. If you know, you've know you presented him as, or some of these people have presented him as not such a pleasant person, the person I have seen is nothing but dedicated to his students. <clears throat> He gives of his time, and he, he's a doer. He's a giver, and I think um, we're doing a disservice to the man. Chrissy, Ms. Pratt. Thank you. I, I just want to add a few things and encourage the board members to think about why each one of us is here on this board and why we want to be here. Speaking for myself, I can't speak for anybody else, of course. I'm here because I am committed to wanting to serve the students and the teachers and the parents and the community members here in Guilford County. That's what I think most of us are here for. And I look at Mr. Logan and his commitment to Guilford County Schools, his commitment to his students, and his desire to be on the board. You know, I'm obviously a newly elected member, and I can tell you after going through the past year, there are a lot of people out there who say, why would you want to be on the Board of Education? Um, you know, it's, it's a challenging role. There are a lot of pieces to it. And to have someone who passionately has that desire and wants to serve the citizens of this community, I think it's absolutely worth taking a look at. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you. Any other comments? All right, um, please vote using your device. Deborah, I'll get to you as soon as everyone has casted their vote, okay? Thank you. Count me your vote's not there. Bear with us, we're having some technical difficulties. And that fails by a vote of six to two. Okay. 
All right, so we'll do that again. Yeah, mine's still not. It's not registering. Excuse me. Um, we'll just do the roll call while we're doing that. Kim? Okay, is it working now? Mine isn't. So we'll just, we'll just. All right, Kim? How do you? Oh, okay. All right, Kim? No. Betty? No. Oh, Alan? No. Linda? Yes. Chrissy? Yes. Diane? No. <laughs> they are. Thank you. Uh, Deborah? No. And Dina, no. That fails by a vote of six to two. We will reconsider. Our, um, is it the February meeting? Because I think January the 26th the board is a work session. January 26th. We, we'll do it at the meeting. work session? Cool. Okay. So we will, um, this consideration for the vacancy will be um, voted on again at the January 26th board work session. We are now at the consent agenda. Um, is there a? Move the consent agenda. Yes. Um, is there a second? Second. Okay. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the board. This evening's consent agenda includes the following items, approval of December 22 meeting minutes, personnel report, 22-23 budget amendments, transfer report, 23-24, 24-25, 25-26, traditional academic calendars, first reading, the school business modernization vendor selection, the town of Gibsonville temporary construction easement 12 foot water main extension at Gibsonville Elementary School, the contractual agreement with MWM Construction LLC for the renovation project at the Sylvia Mendez Newcomer School, the contractual agreement with Samet Corporation for the final guaranteed maximum price or GMP at Claxton School Replacement School project, contractual agreement with Metcon for the final guaranteed maximum price at Kaiser Middle School Replacement School project, the contractual agreement with Barnhill Hold Brothers, a joint venture for early release work at the Faust Robotics and Gaming School Replacement School project. The contractual agreement with DA Everett Christman, a joint venture for early release work at the Peck Expeditionary School Replacement School project and project ordinance revisions for construction of new and replacement schools. That concludes this evening's agenda for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Irby. Yeah, I wanted to know in regard to the school calendar, I had a question. Do you want us to pull that or is it just Pull gonna, it. Okay, so we'll take D off. And what we we're voting on is um, A through C and E through K, E through L. Okay, so we'll pull D. Any other questions? All right, so let's vote on um, A through C and E through L. Mr. Irby? Yes. Betty? Yes. Alan? Yes. Linda? Yes. Chrissy? Yes. Diane? Yes. Dina? Yes. Uh, Deborah? Yes. 
All right, that passes uh, by a vote of eight to zero, and we are now at item D. Kim? Uh, yeah, I was wondering about the um, optional teacher work days and how they can be used. Um, and I just wanted to know whether or not if teacher work days, those optional teacher work days, if they could be used to give to close schools or give teachers a week off as a possibility, or is that something that just those days couldn't be used for? Thank you, Ms. Irby, members of the board. Optional teacher work days are days when teachers have a choice about whether to take their annual leave or not. We're required by state law to offer two optional teacher work days. What we know about the way that they are used in GCS is that a lot of our teachers don't take those days off um, because their annual leave, um, if they keep it, can roll over into their sick leave balance. And that many of our teachers like those work days because it's a, it's a day when um, generally required professional learning is not scheduled. So it, it is a genuine teacher work day when they have an opportunity to do work in their classrooms, uh, which is why we tend to balance those out through the course of the year, where you'll see um, one example is that you'll see that we have an optional work day on the day that teachers come back from the winter break so that there is a day when they can get in their classrooms, get ready for, um, for the post break time frame to start um, with no students and also um, limited staff meetings and, and meetings outside of their classrooms. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. I was just trying to figure out a way to give people consistency and families consistency because sometimes having a day here and a day off and preparing, you know, especially for younger children when school is closed and they don't have access, whereas if you're prepared for a whole week of knowing that school is not available, then it seems like a little bit easier and to give people like an option of having a whole, of using their days for a whole week with no um, penalty, so to speak. We've also used those optional work days. Um, you'll see in the fall semester that there are optional work days when Yom Kippur is on a school day. Uh, so it's a day when teachers um, and other school-based staff members would be able to take that day off as a vacation using their annual leave to celebrate their important religious holiday without uh, missing school during that day. So we're also using them for kind of those important cultural celebrations in our community, okay. um, including some some of the others that we previously discussed. Thank you. Yep. Move the item. Is there a second? Uh, all okay. those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? All right, item D passes unanimously. We are now at um, comments from the chair and I have just a few things to say. Good evening and happy new year. Best of luck to our students who are competing at the district science fair. On January 18th at the Greensboro Science Center, winners will go on to compete in the region five event on February the 11th and then at the state level. We also want to encourage those who are competing in their school spelling bees with the hopes of making it to the district spelling bee on February 7th at Smith High School. Congratulations to Ferndale Middle, which will receive a donation of instruments through the Mr. Holland's Opus Foundation. The donation, which includes a bass drum, saxophones, trombones, flutes, and a clarinet, is worth more than $21,000. Guilford Parent Academy will host two sessions for parents of academically gifted students transitioning to middle or high school. The virtual session for rising sixth grade students is happening now, and the virtual session for rising ninth grade students is scheduled for Thursday, January 12th at 6 p.m. Visit the GPA Guilford Parent Academy webpage for registration details. It's not too late to apply for student meal benefits. The application is located online at www.lunchapplication.com. If you would like to make a donation to offset student meal debt, please visit our website at www.gcsnc.com and find the banner link on our homepage. We have received about $62,000 in donations to offset about $122,000 in school meal debt. We are grateful to the community for its financial support of our students and families. Read to Succeed is coming back. The program will return on February the 2nd and will once again show our youngest readers that reading is fun and powerful. 
Thank you to our partners at WFMY for continuing to bring this message to our students. And finally, I'd like to honor Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as we prepare to celebrate his legacy next Monday. Dr. King once said, make a career of humanity. Commit yourself to the noble struggle for equal rights. You will make a better person of yourself, a great, greater nation of your country, and a finer world to live in. We often talk about how we prepare students for college and career, and his words are just as relevant today as they were in 1959. I know his message lives on through the generations of students who come through Guilford County Schools. Thank you, and this concludes my remarks. We are now at the superintendent's report. Dr. O Good evening and Happy New Year. January is School Board Appreciation Month, and we would like to express our gratitude to our Board of Education members for all that they do for our students and staff. Some of our staff members will come up with just a small token of appreciation for you and your work. Being a board member is certainly a difficult job, one that requires making tough decisions on a regular basis. <laughs> I am proud of what this board has accomplished over the last few years from rallying behind a robust academic recovery strategy, yielding nationally recognized programs, supporting new mental health and school safety efforts, advocating for better pay for our employees, and ensuring we remain on track to address our facility needs. I am grateful for your wisdom and your leadership as we address complex issues together impacting our district and our community. Congratulations to our own T. Diane Bellamy Small, who will receive the Everyday Champion of Civil Rights Award from the city of Greensboro on Monday at the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Breakfast. She is being recognized for having made substantial con contributions in furtherance of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s vision, civil rights, civil liberties, and human rights in Greensboro. Diane is among the five inaugural recipients of this award and will be joined by our colleague Melvin Skip Alston, Chair of the Board of County Commissioners. We thank them both for their service to our students and our community on behalf of the district. The Choice Schools application period will open this Friday, January 13th. Families who wish to enroll in one of our choice schools can apply online at gcsnc.schoolment.net through February 20th, 2023. All choice schools will be welcoming parents and families at the GCS Choice Showcase happening Wednesday, February 1st from 5.30 to 8 p.m. at the Greensboro Coliseum Special Events Center. This is a really great opportunity to learn more about what makes schools unique and narrow down lists of possibilities. Our youngest students will definitely want to check out the kindergarten experience area complete with a school bus and a cafeteria line so that they may practice and experience a school setting for the first time. Congratulations to Jericho Carrillo, band teacher at the Southern at Southern High and the GCS Rookie Teacher of the Year, who is now a finalist for the state's beginning teacher of the year award presented by the North Carolina Center for the Advancement of Teaching. In March, he will have the opportunity to participate in a week-long conference on leadership during which this, this year's winner will be announced. Our district has received two major grants recently that will greatly support our students. First, through the efforts of Representative Kathy Manning, we will receive $2.2 million in community project funding to support the expansion of learning hubs into middle schools. As you may recall, Manning was instrumental in securing $2 million last year to help fund our tutoring initiative, which has received national acclaim along with the Learning Hubs program. We're very grateful for her support of our students' academic recovery through these two initiatives. Secondly, we will receive $14.8 million from the U.S. Department of Education for school-based mental health services. The funding will help us expand mental health supports at 61 schools and allow the district to create 16 new full-time mental health clinician positions over the next five years. The school-based mental health services grant requires federal and district project investments. The federal government will provide 75% of project funding and the district will provide a 25% match. 
the Department of Education will provide $14,835,019 over five years, and GCS will provide $3,708,755, bringing the total investment in school-based mental health services for students to $18,543,744. Through our community conversations, we've spoken a great deal about the need for increased mental health services for both students and staff, and the recent tragedies in our community underscore how urgent that need truly is. Mental health will continue to be an area of focus for our district as we work to build a brighter future together. February 1st is an important day in history for Greensboro and for the nation. The A&T for Middle College at North Carolina A&T State University will once again participate in a march to mark the occasion. I know these students and many others in GCS will study, understand, and appreciate the sacrifice made by the Greensboro Four at the Woolworths counter in 1960. And finally, I would like to invite the community to two additional Better Together community conversations happening in January. These will be from 6 to 7 p.m. on January 18th at Allen J. Prep Academy and on January 24th at Dudley High School. Visit gcsnc.com slash better together to RSVP for these events. Public schools indeed belong to all of us, and I look forward to hearing from all members of our Guilford County community. This concludes my remarks and I'll invite Tara Trexler, Chief Financial Officer, to share our annual comprehensive financial report. Good evening and thank you, Chairperson Hayes, Superintendent and board members. Um, tonight we have the pleasure of bringing to you uh, another audited financial uh, comprehensive report. And we have a new face with us tonight. Um, Mr. Greg Miller uh, is a director with Forbus. And Forbus is probably not a name you've heard. If you've been around a while, you would recognize Dixon Hughes has been our audit firm the last several years. But during the past year, there was a merger of companies, and they rebranded as Forbus. And so new face, new name, but uh, same great experience that we have had for our audit. Uh, so at this point, I will turn it over to Mr. Miller to share the report. Thank you, Tara. Can you guys hear me OK? <clears throat> Madam Chair, members of the board, superintendent, in front of you, there's a, quite a few documents. Uh, there's one that looks like this that's up on the, the slides, which is what I will be going through uh, during my presentation. There's a, another document behind it, the portrait that's this size. This is the formal auditing standards version of this report. This is the talking version. This is the written version. Also in front of you is a copy of the ACFR, or the Annual Comprehensive Financial Report. That's the thick document um, that, that's in front of you. These are your financial statements. Uh, the first slide of the talking points, the presentation, is my roadmap. Um, as, on behalf of Forbes, I uh, first want to thank you all for entrusting us uh, with your audit services. And I also would like to thank you for having me here tonight uh, to go through the financial statements and the results of our audit. Uh, it speaks volumes when a board invites their auditor uh, to come to present the results of the audit. Uh, it sets a great tone at the top for the organization and shows that you guys stress the importance of financial transparency and accuracy. So with that, I will jump into the discussion of our audit results. Uh, as I mentioned, the thick document in front of you is your uh, annual comprehensive financial report. That is your set of financial statements that are prepared by management with your oversight. We were engaged by management to audit the financial statements. This is a thick document. Uh, it is tabbed. There are multiple sections in here. The financial statement audit primarily covers the financial section. That's uh, the financial statements as well as the notes to the financial statements. There's also a section before that called the introductory section. And there's the letter of transmittal um, and uh, certificates of achievement for financial reporting and organizational charts. The information or introductory section is not audited by us, just by the content of what's in there. 
we can't always uh, vouch what's in that piece of information. There's budgetary information, there's economic outlook information in there uh, as well. Towards the back is the statistical section. Those are trend tables, so 10 years worth of uh, financial information, so you can kind of see where the trajectories are or not. Due to the long time nature of that, we also do not audit that piece of information, um, but it, we do read that information for consistency with what is presented in the current year financial statements. And the last section is the compliance section. Uh, that is the compliance as it relates to the uniform guidance for single audit that relates to your federal funding as well as the State Single Audit Implementation Act, which is for your state funding, as well as reports on our governmental auditing standards, which are an additional layer of auditing standards that we have to perform our audit under due to the nature of your operations. Within the financial section, there's also RSI, or um, uh, required supplementary information. Uh, those are some trend tables, particularly around uh, pension and OPEB funding levels and contribution amounts. Uh, that information is, is also not audited. Uh, and then we also have OSI information, which is co primarily combining schedules, which then roll up into the face of financial statements. The opinion as it relates to the OSI information, other supplementary information, is how it relates back to the financial statements. Does it agree back to the face of the financial statements? So that is an overview of the financial statements from uh, a big picture standpoint. Long-winded way to say that within the financial statements, there's a lot of work done by finance to put this together. Uh, and there's probably six to eight pages of our report that go into this document that covers primarily the financial statements and the notes to them. I am pleased to uh, present tonight that our opinion on the financial statements is an unmodified or opinion or a clean opinion, which is the type of opinion that you are looking for. Uh, that means management has prepared financial statements that are, in our opinion, in all material respects, in accordance with uh, the auditing standards generally accepted in the United States. <coughs> So that's that slide. From a compliance audit standpoint, this is the federal major programs. So this is the audit that we have to perform over expenditure of federal fundings. These were the major programs that were within the scope uh, of our audit for fiscal year 22. Uh, and as a result of our uh, uh, procedures, we did not identify any internal control deficiencies that we consider to be material weaknesses and we did not identify any material non-compliance that's required to be reported uh, under the uniform guidance. Same thought process, but rather from a federal standpoint, this is on a state standpoint. These were the state programs that we audited for fiscal year 22, and again, as a result of our procedures, we did not identify any internal controls that we consider to be, or any deficiencies in internal controls that we consider to be material weaknesses, and we did not identify uh, any material non-compliance that would be re required to be reported. For both of those compliance audits, uh, those are not legal opinions. We are CPA, certified public accountants, and not attorneys. Uh, so those are not legal opinions as to uh, GSC's compliance with federal or state regulations. Continuing on to the required communications uh, to those charged with governance, the auditing standards set uh, particular items that we have to tell those charged with governance, whether in this uh, um, uh, medium, in person, or in written format. Uh, and a lot of that just has to do um, with significant items within the audit. So the first piece is significant estimates uh, within the financial statements. With any set of financial statements, there are certain numbers that don't tie directly to an invoice or go directly to a cash receipt that came in on a particular day. And they require a certain level of estimate. Uh, so that requires management's judgment to um, estimate what those amounts would be. The biggest ones in your financial statements are pension liabilities and OPEB liabilities. There's a lot of actuarial sciences that go into that. It is supported by data. It is supported by those assumptions. But there are judgments made in those, in those uh, valuations. We did review uh, the data that goes into uh, those actuarial val uh, valuations, and we also reviewed um, the assumptions taken into determining that valuation and determining whether those are reasonable in all material um, aspects. The next two bullets kind of look um, onerous, if you want, onerous, if you want. Uh, it says difficulties, disagreements, uh, uncorrected, et cetera, which, which looks negative. I'd ask you to focus on the sub bullet versus the, the, the larger bullet, which is we did not encounter any difficulties in performing the audit. 
uh, or have any disagreements with management. Uh, I appreciate Tara and, and Angie in the back uh, and all their team support uh, in providing us with the information for the audit. I can only audit the information that was provided for us. Uh, and it's really uh, um, an testament to management for the timely completion of the audit of being able to provide us complete and accurate information on a timely basis. So thank you guys for, for your work on that. And the written version is a copy of our management representation letter. That's a standard representation letter that management says, hey, the information that we gave you is accurate and complete to the best of our knowledge. We have implemented a system of internal controls, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those are standard and not very significant changes between periods, except for sometimes the, the, a change in accounting standards, which is the last bullet on this. Fiscal year 22 is the first year for GASB statement number 87, which deals with leases. In prior years, there was a concept of an operating lease and a capital lease. Those two theories have kind of uh, converged to uh, just one, a lease. Um, so what used to be an operating lease was probably brought onto the face of the financial statement as a capital asset, which is a right to use lease asset, and it was offset by uh, an associated liability. So your impact on that position uh, was, was nothing, essentially. Um, so that was the first year. Um, this fiscal year was the first year for GASB 87. So that was the biggest change. There are some reps in the rep letter that deal specifically with GASB 87. Again, I'd like to acknowledge Angie's heavy lift uh, in implementing that, pulling all of the lease documents throughout a school, uh, uh, school district is uh, not a small task. Uh, and then to analyze those, whether they fit into the scope or not into the scope and create the journal entries in order to record that information uh, is a very daunting and time consuming task. So I appreciate all the legwork uh, on implementing that set of uh, accounting standards. And for the board, as you hear Angie reference, I just want to make sure, and I'd like to recognize her, take this opportunity. Angie Ludeman is our executive director in financial services, because I know you may have been looking for Angie Henry, who was still CFO at the time of this data. But uh, Angie Ludeman, are you here? Yes. And she has been very inter instrumental, and I know um, she worked well with Greg as well. So I just want to make sure you knew there's there's another Angie. Sorry, I should have, should have made that specific. Uh, just to kind of give a very high level uh, overview of the financial performance for the year, uh, in front of you is a, a graph on revenues. So overall state uh, revenue increased 9.8 million, um, and that's primarily driven by increases in salary and payroll costs, as well as increased transportation costs. And although it did increase in dollar amount from prior year, uh, state funding did decrease as a percent of total revenues. Uh, federal funding kind of made up for that difference, which increased 105 million, uh, driven by various uh, pandemic-related uh, relief programs and dollars that came from that. County and other local revenue also increased by 19.9 uh, million, uh, which represents about 29% of your total revenues. Continuing from the flip side of that, the expenditure side, Total expenditures increased approximately 103.7 million or 16%, again, due to higher payroll costs as well as transportation costs. Um, of those total expenditures, instructional expenditures represented approximately 25% of total expenditures, which is down about 3% from fiscal year 21. And then the remaining 25% is made up of other uh, expenditures, uh, which is an increase of 11% from the prior year. At the end of the day, revenues minus expenditures equal your change in fund balance. So whether your fund balance went up or went down as the result of the year. So at year end, the general and special revenue fund balance uh, was 21.8 million, which is a decrease of about 2% from fiscal year 21. Uh, fund balance that is available for appropriation, uh, which represents the portion of fund balance uh, that's non, which is not non-spendable, which is your self-insurance deposit. Uh, it uh, excludes your restricted by state statute as well as your committed fund balance. That amount of uh, fund balance that's available for appropriation uh, was about 10.8 million. Uh, it was a 1.9 increase or 21% increase from prior year. Now at the bottom of, of fund, uh, fund balance is unassigned fund balance, which was 7.3 million, which is an increase of 2.8 or 65% from fiscal year 21. <clears throat> Uh, as I mentioned, fund balance from uh, available for appropriation for the general special revenue funds uh, in its in total, in total 
uh, is approximately 1% of your total governmental expenditures, excluding capital outlay, um, which is about a decrease of, of 4%. 4% sounds like a big number, but looking at the chart, it goes from 1.17, and last year is 1.12, uh, but that math is about a 4%. And then unassigned fund balance represents about three quarters of a percent of total governmental expenditures, which is an increase of 42% of from fiscal year 21. Kind of leaving the governmental fund arena and getting into the proprietary fund uh, arena uh, with school food, food services, uh, its net position increased uh, approximately 14.4 million over the prior year, which is driven by the USDA's waiver for uh, children during the uh, 21 and 22 school year to receive um, uh, uh, to receive food at no cost. Uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of revenue. Um, there's a big influx of revenue due to pandemic relief. So 16.4 increase is USDA uh, increased revenue for that waiver. Those increases in revenue were also partially offset uh, by approximately 4 million increase in payroll cost, as well as just inflation's impact on the actual cost of food um, uh, during that time period. And looking at prior year, the prior year decrease uh, was a result of lost revenue due to closures of, of schools at, at varying points and varying uh, durations throughout uh, the pandemic. So if you're looking from a comparison from current year to prior year, 22 to 21, one is low because of closures, 22 is high due to USDA waivers. So you have two impacts going opposite directions with each other um, for two preceding years. <clears throat> I'm not going to uh, go through these in very much detail, but just as a public service and a general announcement, I feel if, if I talk a little bit about the new GASB pronouncements, which are the new accounting standards that are coming down the pipe, um, the more I speak about it, the more people learn about it, um, the easier the implementation goes. So I'd just like to leave this as a client service on the back end to, to let you know of what the accounting standards changes are coming down uh, for the next couple of years. Um, I will like to highlight, uh, particularly on this slide, GASB statement number 96, which is subscription-based IT arrangements. Uh, GASB 87, which was implemented for fiscal year 22, dealt with leases, uh, and that was a first-time change to bring on those operating leases onto the face of the financial statements. This is very similar. The um, thought process and terminology is very similar uh, between 96 and 97, but it deals with cloud-hosted subscriptions. So a lot of the times, um, software up in the cloud, we get a subscription. We have the right to use that, that subscription and use that IT. Uh, so that is a right to use asset that the school board has. So that should be reflected on the financial statements and there should be a liability um, for what the required minimum payments are going forward. So that is in for fiscal year 23, the year we are currently in. Um, and that will be another big lift um, to go through all of those uh, arrangements that are out there to analyze whether they should be included or not. And with that, I'll leave with the other ones out there, but I, I don't plan on talking about each uh, one of those. But if you do have any questions or comments on those, I'm more than happy uh, to answer any questions on those or my presentation. <clears throat> Thank you, Diane. And then Kim. Okay, on page six, um, I just wanted to know are we getting uh, all we should be getting as far as bus allocations from the state? Or is there something else we can do to get more money coming in? Is that what that represents on page six? Uh, or you just say uh, state appropriations, school bus? Correct. So what, what, what on page six is uh, the state appropriations, school buses? What I'm saying is the money that was appropriate the money was spent was spent in accordance with the compliance requirements that the schools are required to um, spend them under but it, it doesn't do any we don't do any procedures within the scope of our audit to consider whether there's more out there but what you got but, was well, well i think that was presented. more of a question from Ms. Traxler instead of you mr miller if you don't mind uh, sure and this um i believe is the um, funds we receive were the state leases our replacement school buses. And so it's pulled out uh, by itself. Textbooks are considered a separate fund. All of our other state money is included in this state public school fund. Um, so yes, this is uh, the school bus lease um, entry that we record where the state 
uh, enters those leases okay. and makes the payments for us. Okay, Th that's not the question, but I'll ask okay. it direct uh, offline. And then on page 14, did we spend all of the uh, pandemic related funds for that? Uh, for, for, for did, you know, he's, I think Mr. Miller said we got in like what, 14 million for food, for uh, nutrition, is that correct? Of, of uh, pandemic related funds? Yeah, there was a, a an increase of 16.4 overall for federal, an increase of 16.4. Uh -huh. um, on here, federal revenues totaled 50.5 million for the uh -huh. current year, which is an increase of 16.4. Um, offhand, I do not know if it was all spent or if there's still some left sitting in net position. Um, Yes, uh, this would be the, the reference to our federal reimbursement. Once we know the participation, the number of meals that we can apply each month, uh, this shows federal revenues uh, between the three fiscal years. Uh, so the 50 million is the increase uh, or represents the, the total amount. Uh, and what we're, I believe what Mr. Miller was highlighting, there's an increase there because of the difference in operation during that first really felt the effects uh, year of the pandemic. And then last year, kids were back in school and more were being fed and they were being fed at no cost to families. Mm -hmm. So we were able to apply for the federal reimbursements. So this wasn't an ESSER grant that came to us. Mm -hmm. This is an increase in our federal reimbursement because every child was eligible to eat for free and we were feeding more students. Okay, well, that doesn't answer my question, I'm but sorry. I'll ask it off, offline then, because what I want to know is did we spend all the money or do we still have any of the money? We would, uh, at the 14 million that's at the bottom of that column, uh -huh. we would have that to add to this year's budget and carry forward. Okay. That's an increase added to our budget. Is Thank that, you. You're welcome. Thank you, Kim. Uh, yeah, I have a question really in regard to like your process because you said you, you these were the state programs that you chose or that you chose to look at because I'm under the impression that when you come, you're asking us for the, to see the information and then you prepare the information to give to him. Am I correct or not understanding the process of how we do perform audits? Yeah, so um, from... Uh, a compliance standpoint, there's multiple different compliant, there are multiple different grants that the school uh, receives on any given year. Uh, there are certain dollar thresholds um, on what might be a material program or not a material program. And from there, that kind of dictates how uh, a particular program is selected. So if you have a really large one, it's be a type A program. Um, so that's uh, one of your largest programs. That one's gonna get tested every two years. So every on the third year, it'll get tested. Uh, the type B programs, which are not immaterial, but aren't your largest programs, will get cycled through periodically, uh, but, but aren't required to be tested every two years. So there is a, um, a professional standard I have to follow in how to calculate and to determine which programs get selected for a given year. Um, and that's the, re the programs that were on that slide were the ones that were tested for this year. Um, from there, we do get information from management that would say, hey, this is the program we're testing for this year. Can you provide me the detail on what makes up this dollar amount that you spent in this program? We then select a sample of those expenditures and we compare those expenditures against the requirements that whether it be the state funding, so the state compliance requirements or federal funding, the federal compliance requirements uh, on whether they were spent in accordance with that grant agreement and the corresponding compliance requirements. Okay, and the, the other uh, question I had was in regard to the fund balance. Um, and I see that you said there was a 20% increase in the fund balance. Uh, so total fund balance um, had a 2% had a change, but the, un or the fund balance that was available for appropriation went up 21%, which is, is about 1.9% increase. That's the amount left over after there's various classifications of fund balance, the first one being non-spendable, so that takes fund balance to sit down that you can't spend. It's already spent, or inventory makes up that, you don't have inventory, but that's an example of one. What you do have is your self-insurance deposits, so that's cash sitting in your bank, but you can't, well, in your agency, right. that you cannot spend, it's already gone. 
Um, it also does not include uh, any amounts that are restricted by state statute. So the state says you have to set aside X right. amount of fund balance. So you back that out of fund balance, and that's the portion um, that increased 21% in relation to fiscal year 21, which is about $1.9 uh, million. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Linda. <clears throat> I just want to clarify what you do. Is there certain, certain rules and regs that we have to follow for certain money, correct? So your job is to come in and make sure we followed the rules and regs, correct? Correct. However, you do not know whether we spent it effectively. You don't know whether we got bang for a buck. You don't know anything behind that, correct? You yes. just know that we followed the rules. Correct. Yes. We, the, a financial statement of compliance audit is not a performance audit, and a performance audit is what you're looking for from an operational e efficiency um, standpoint. Right. So if we did a contract and that contract, the and contractor didn't deliver what we thought we were going to get, you have no clue about that. Or whether we, you have no clue. You know that the money was accounted for, right? But you don't know, we, we should get certain thing, but the quality of what we got, you have no clue about. Our uh, engagement, is, I couldn't attest I to. I'm, I'm just saying, I'm trying to clarify what this audit does. Um, if you would like to jump in on that. Tara. Yes, what uh, Forbus audits is that everything is materially, nothing is materially misstated. So everything, the numbers we're presenting are um, reliable for the public to use and internally and that our internal controls, they also audit that our internal controls are in place to safeguard the right. district. So it's a procedure, rule, law, check. Right, it's not a performance Thank audit. You. As that, I just Thank wanted you. to clarify that. Thank you. All right, well, thank you. All right, we are now at the policy committee. I will turn to board member Jenkins. Good evening. Good evening. At the meeting held on December the 7th, 2022, the policy committee voted to send two policy recommendations out for a 30-day public comment period from January 10th through February 9th. The policy was 1510-4200-7270, which is school safety. Also, policy 2121, which consists of board member conflicts of interest. The purpose of these policy revision is to bring the policy into alignment with state law. As a reminder, these policy recommendations will come back to the board for discussion at our March meeting after the public has had a chance to give their input. Thank you. Any questions? All right, we are now at uh, the Facilities Naming Committee. Ms. Snapper? You're on. Okay. Do you have the information there with you? Put her mic, turn it on. Okay, there you go. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So the facilities naming committee report, uh, we had a meeting on December 14th. And we took into consideration two facility name um, applications, nominations. The first one is for High Point Central High's baseball field to be named in honor of former baseball coach Andrew T. Harper. The um, appropriate paperwork was submitted for the nomination, and we do have supporting documentation from the current principal, the also the principal at uh, high, uh, the I'm sorry, the principal at High Point Central, and the athletic director there, current and former students, as well as an alumnus who is now the uh, senior director of player development for the Kansas City Royals, which was very neat to see. There's been numerous reports of his positive impact his development of his own nonprofit and his community and um, student and player support. I have not to this point received any further um, 
discussion points about that nomination. And the second nomination was to modify the name of Kearns Academy at High Point Central to simply the Kearns Academy based on the longevity of the school's existence. From what I understand, and uh, thank you to Diane Bellamy Small for her clarification with this, Kearns Academy was initially to be returned to the campus at High Point Central, but now it has been on its own campus for more than six years, and so we are looking to simply amend the name and remove the High Point Central mention because it is not on the High Point Central location. The committee is asking that the board consider a 20 day comment period so that these nominations can come back to the board for a final vote during the February 7th meeting. The reason for this is to allow us to make the name change to High Point Central's baseball field as the season, as the baseball season starts in the spring, um, hopefully as the first game commences. And if we can uh, take a 20 day comment period, that'll allow them to dedicate the field as the season begins. So with that, I would like to make a motion that the board accepts the nomination to name High Point Central High School baseball field, the Andrew T. Harper Memorial Field, and to modify the name of Kearns Academy at High Point Central to the Kearns Academy. And to send this, uh, both of these nominations out for a 20 day public comment period. So, okay, is there a second? <clears throat> so um, I know it's to send it out, but I think what we're voting on is 20 day versus 30 day. Oh, okay. And Jill, is there um, anything that we need to do other than that is a... Okay. So, <clears throat> so this is again, voting on the 20 day public comment period because of the baseball schedule. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, any questions? All right, uh, those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Thank you, any opposed? All right, well that passes unanimously. So thank you and the committee. Uh, we are now at action items, uh, policy for uh, 4110, immunizations and health requirements for school administration, for school admission. I will turn again to board member Betty Jenkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. I make a motion to adopt policy number 4110, immunization and health um, requirements for the school administration, school admission as presented. The background information um, for this is there was no comment that was received from the period of November the 15th through December the 15th, and this is really to align with board policy to the state law. Second. Um, any questions? Kim, you have a question? No questions? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, so that passes unanimously. We are now at the Pisgah Church Road property sale precedes usage. Move the item. Second. Hold on, I'm trying to find it. Um, I'm not, I don't understand what the Pisgah Church Road property sale proceeds usage action item is. is. It says that the administration recommends that the board assigns the proceeds um, from the sale towards a specific purpose. Does it say what specific purpose? They got to pick one. Just for historical context, there was discussion about the proceeds from this when we were discussing the athletics at Grimsley and Kaiser, and there, there was some belief that there was board action that was taken that designated the funds for that purpose. There is no record of formal board action that was taken, um, which is why this was being brought to the board this evening. But don't we need to say what that specific purpose is? Correct, and so I mean, we, we discussed the use for the Grimsley ath Athletic on that on that campus where Brooks is, um, but there was never board action um, that was taken. Okay, so Diane, you move the item. Yeah, but okay, so we are going to use this for, uh, uh, Madam Superintendent. I need a little bit more clarification. We are using this for the Grimsley. A board member asked that this be put on the agenda. 
for us to consider because formal action wasn't taken when the discussion was had. Okay. So if there were to be a motion in the I ideal world, I think the motion would say that I move that we apply the proceeds from the sale of the Pisgah Church property to the athletic facilities at Grimsley or related to the Grimsley campus. I think that is the what a motion would be were that the desire of the board. Okay, if, that motion. Um, there a second? I'll second. second. Okay. Discussion? Yeah, because I, I, need, I need to be refreshed in that regard because I don't remember agreeing to that. Use your mic. I'm sorry. Use your mic, your outside voice, right? Um, <laughs> you know, I don't honestly remember agreeing to using these funds, and I know we have new board members here as well, so can, can we table this? until next month, until we get all the information again, is what I'm asking. Right, I moved to table that until next board meeting, until we get clarity. So that ends the discussion about it. After that, is there a second to table it? I'll second. All right, now you vote on the Aye, yes. I know. I just hadn't gotten to that yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm just you trying to make sure me. there aren't any going to be any delays um, or anything like that, um, because I, I do think right. the gap in having the conversation and now um, is uh, is problematic. Are we inviting discussion on the table you can't motion? Table. Right. Cannot. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, okay, Kim. Hold on. But if it fails, then you. <laughs> Okay, Kim, yes. Uh, Betty? No. Alan? No. Linda? Uh, yes, and my reasoning is, is I don't really know where we're at with this situation. Okay, uh, Chrissy? Yes, ditto to what Linda said. Diane? No. All right, um, Dina, no. Deborah? No, and I'll be happy to answer any question and give any updates that I can. Okay, so that um, fails by a vote of five to three. Um, so go ahead. I, I wanted to have some discussion for it too, Kim. Uh, go ahead, Deborah. So this actually, I can understand why everyone doesn't uh, quite remember what the discussion was because this was back before we started active work and the groundbreaking on the uh, Kaiser rebuild. So. If you remember, God, it's probably been at least a year ago, y'all. Um, we sat through a work session where they explained that the only viable space on the Kaiser Grimsley campus to rebuild Kaiser Middle School was on their softball field. Kaiser and Grimsley have dedicated softball boosters that have put uh, hundreds and thousands of dollars into that softball field. They have professional grade equipment. Some of it we were able to pull up and store. Some of it we were able to repurpose to different areas. Um, and what they're asking for from us is since we had to take the softball field that they dedicated their time and their money to, that we basically return their investment. Um, and so they're asking that once Kaiser is rebuilt and the new softball field can be put back together, that we put this money aside to replace what they had which uh, we discussed, I, I can't remember um, which meeting it was, we discussed and there was an informal agreement where everyone agreed that that was reasonable, but nothing like a formal vote saying, this is exactly what we're going to do with this money. And um, that's what's being asked now is just a formal agreement to replace what we have taken away from Kaiser and Grimsley at their ball field. Uh, Diane? Well, first of all, we didn't take anything away. We're going to give them a brand new school with more amenities than what they had before. So uh, I just would, uh, but I think that in the spirit of respecting um, the effort that, you know, if we can have monies that will help uh, make that new facility, whatever the, you know, 
top level that we can make it, then and it not have to come out of the construction money, um, then that's a win-win. Okay. Any other discussion, Betty? Um, added to that, it was not a formal vote. It was not a vote. It was really during time in closed session, a conversation that was held. So it was not a total agreement um, agreement about that. It was conversation. That's why she um, Deborah asked to put it back on the agenda so we can have a vote on it. I remember having some public conversation about it. Um, I just think we don't have all of the history here to that. But um, if um, if is is there a motion then to approve this or is there any other? Hmm? Our agenda. Yes. And Deborah second it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so, um, Madam Chair. Yes. No. Okay. So one of the things that is not here is how much money that is. And I guess my question would be is that if it's not it's all here. needed. Where? Oh, okay. The $2,229,950. Oh, okay. right. right. I didn't look at the, the support document. Okay. But then if all of it's not needed, would we just put it back in a reserve for mm -hmm. a later day or something else? Okay, I mean, because I just don't want it to just lay out there, you know, like no. a big fish or something. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, thank you. Okay, I have a question. Okay, Kim. From her explanation, she's saying that we are actually reimbursing a booster club for money that they use, that they raise funds for. I'm, I'm going by what Deborah said. She said they put hundreds and thousands of dollars into it right not, so they have they, they have would have donated it. it to us it is our property and we are continuing to maintain and control the money that it will all be for the benefit of guilford county school students we're not giving anything to a booster club or reimbursing them for for that are we sure <laughs> i understood it as symbolically acknowledging that generosity with this pr proper use of these funds okay so then okay look well i'm gonna vote i okay. I'm, I'm, I'm i'm linda and then we'll take i'm not gonna hold it up but i i just find that <laughs> to put something on the agenda and now we're revisiting a whole conversation about a conversation right. that we had in closed session and then bringing it to the public. I don't, it, it, it wasn't this, in closed session. I don't know if we had some conversation in closed session, and that, but this was an open session. Right, but that's the problem. She, Betty is saying closed session. Deborah is saying money back to a booster club. Like it, it just, it's not, it's not clear. It's not clear for me what exactly what we're doing. Um, it's just not clear. Thank you. Um, Linda? Okay. Well, I'm going to try to get some clarification a little bit here. All right. With the new school, the intent of this is to rebuild the baseball fields. Is that what I'm hearing? Okay. Yeah. So with the new school, that would not have been provided in general. Okay. Hold on, Deborah. Michelle Reed is coming to the podium. So for the new, oh, sorry, um, for the new school with the Kaiser Middle, uh, the site that we've identified and the, the um, master planning efforts that we did located at the school having to be built on the Kaiser, um, the softball fields for Grimsley and for um, baseball. Um, the location that we've chosen, we have to, if we were going to rebuild those sites, we have to relocate the softball fields proposed in the master plan on the current Brooks Global location. Um, at this point in time, we don't have all the funding. This was in discussion previously, earmarked these dollars appropriated towards that as seed money to help with the rebuilding of that baseball and softball field. All right, um, Kim, I'm sorry. So what we're actually doing is allocating the money towards Brooks Global or these baseball fields, wherever they are. All right, so it is an allocation 
and assigning the money is kind of like doing an ordinance, but in, in uh, uh, kind of, in uh, what do you call it? Not formal, but it is kind of, yeah, an in-house ordinance, kind of. All right, got it. Okay, Kim? Betty? Yes. Alan? Yes. Linda? Yes. Chrissy? Yes. Diane? Yes. Dina? Yes. Deborah? Yes. Okay, that passes by a vote of seven to one. Thank you. We are now at, um, this is the last piece here, the reconsideration of the North Carolina School Board Association Action Center contribution. Um, and this was tabled from, um, or asked to be brought up at a later meeting. Move the item. Is there a second? Any conversation? Chrissy? I'm curious to know what the $10,000 gets us. What do we get out of it? I know we pay a membership fee that's separate from that, and this is an additional contribution. So what's the, the payoff for us? Yeah, so the Action Center has uh, one registered lobbyist. Um, there are three registered on the C3 arm of the organization, but the Action Fund gets you one extra lobbyist that advocates for issues on the legislative agenda of the Action Center. Uh, if there is a big issue campaign, uh, sometimes they um, are able to communicate their message out, and they will use some of these funds to pay for, for those efforts. So we already have access to lobbyists, but this gets us access to more, is what you're saying? To Correct. one more person? To one more. And so in the past, have we gotten what we've needed from the lobbyists that are available to us? Um, you know, Riley, right now, it's a very challenging environment. Oh, yes. um, <laughs> so I think that uh, folks have tried their best, but um, it's very challenging to, to get what uh, will benefit you know, Guilford County. Okay. All right. Thank you. Linda, Diane, then Kim. Okay. okay. What we need to understand, there's an ongoing battle with count, flexible calendar. That's ongoing. There's been an ongoing battle with fund eight. There's been an ongoing battle about the performance grades. And this organization is consistently on top of it and consistently fighting for those situations for um, the school system. Um, fund eight is a fund that we have for spe things that grants, special things that we went after that we put money in. And fund eight is a big fight, ongoing fight forever. Okay. So as soon as we kind of like get it calmed down, because the charter schools don't really understand what the, I believe that fund is. They want a portion, because they get a portion of everything that the school system has. So then they want a portion of that fund eight. However, they can go on after their own grants. They can go after the same things that are in that fund by themselves for their needs, okay? Now, so it would be like, if they want to give us, here's the way I look at it. They got their own fund data sitting over there where they've gotten grants, they've gotten money that they've gone after, all right? But they're not gonna give us their, a share of their money to come back to us. Because we're all going after the same kind of pot of money. And we get, we get certain, and they get, it's not like they don't get grants. Tara, come help me out with the what all they get in there. I'm sorry, can I call her up here? Tell, what are you wanting her to explain? Just what, what goes in fund day. Can you do oh, that? yes. <clears throat> Lots of different things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can do this one if you want to. Yeah. Yes, Fund 8, the uh, primary uh, funds in Fund 8, which is called the Special Revenue Fund, is grants and donations that the district receives. Um, there's also smaller portions, the indirect costs we receive off our federal grants which is what covers our overhead to administer federal grants also goes in that fund as well. Charter schools get indirect costs for doing their launch if they do launch? That would be a yes. Yes, that's independent of us. Yes, it's independent of us, but they get it, okay? They do grants and they get money for grants. That would be their fund date, correct? Yes. They can. Mm -hmm. I also get, what was the other one? 
grants. Donations. Donations. So donations in that particular pot are donations that maybe a big philanthropist decided that they wanted Guilford County help Guilford County's reading program. Would that go in fund eight? Yes, and often the grants and donations that come into fund eight come with restrictions. That's why they're recorded in a special revenue okay. fund right. instead of our general funds. So All right. Very specific purposes. Which there again, a philanthropist could give a charter school money, correct? So they can get that fund eight represents everything that a charter school could do, right? However, the charter schools, and I'm not against charter schools, everybody understand I am not totally against charter schools. However, this money is meant for Guilford County Schools. I don't understand their logic in coming after this money. So, but it has been continuous, and I will say the, the um, North Carolina School Board Association has been strong on fighting at least those four important things that we have going on. I mean, the calendar, the performance grades, mm -hmm. the uh, fund eight fight, um, and other things, and they're there, okay? I cannot be there and keep track of what's going on. They do that. I also, so, and I can also tell you that lots of lobbyists on the charter school side are there to push their, to push their message. There again, I'm not against charters, but on fund aid, I'm on the school system side, okay? So, you know, without them keeping us informed when people are making a motion to do something, when we can't be there to keep the pulse, okay? North Carolina School Board keeps the pulse on what's going on up there and lets us know that they are working and actually have reached out to school board members on the legislative committee to come help them support an initiative. So I think it's very key that we keep them personally. And that's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you. That was very thorough. <clears throat> um, any other, you, you good, Ms. Pratt? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, so any other discussion? If there's not, we can go ahead and vote on it. Uh, just for clarification so that our minutes are clear, when Diane said she moved the item, she means she moves to fund the uh, project. Mm -hmm. just, just so everyone's clear. To, right. Thank you. Hmm? No, I, we've got it. We just wanted to make yeah, sure we have the record correct. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just want to say that Yes, the North Carolina School Board Association and this fund, and it is problematic to a certain degree for me because we already pay a fee to participate in the School Board Association. And then this is an additional fee. And then we also have a delegation of Guilford de delegation of about 12 legislators that we work with that advocate for our legislative agenda, that we don't have to pay them ex any extra money. And they have a whole staff of people that we don't pay any extra for. Um, so that's where I fall, you know, with paying extra money for services that we are already gonna get, regardless of whether or not we pay into this fund or not. Um, and I think we are the best advocates for ourselves and that we could do more as a school board and as a legislative committee. Yes, we can do more in advocating for the things that Guilford needs. And I did see in the, um, the communication that now the, the lobbyists, we can ask them to um, lobby for some designated items on our legislative agenda, but that wasn't the past. In the past couple of years, Christy, they weren't allowed to, um, to lobby for anything specific with Guilford County. So that is new what they have added to the fee that they charge for the $10,000. Right now, going forward, if we pay it, they can um, you know, advocate for the things in Guilford County. That has been the change. Is that because of the C4 status? Um, I'm not as familiar with that particular uh, point, but you know the 501c3 rules 
have some limitations on how people can advocate. Right. And then the 501c4, you know, they can be more active. So if there was a bill they're going after, they can, uh, you know, have marketing materials that might say, you know, vote a certain way uh, on eggs. So it gives the 501c4 status, gives them that flexibility. No. Yes. 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 Chrissy. No. Diane. Yes. Deborah. Yes. And Dina. Yes. That passes by a vote of six to two. Um, my first comment has to do with a question that was asked as to how we would have uh, a teacher with uh, you know, a different kinds of opinion. Well, first of all, we, we uh, as, a, as a school system, are uh, bound to not discriminate uh, against folk because of race, creed, color, religion, political affiliation. And as a public school, I mean, just look around this room. We have all ages, races, shapes, sizes. That's what makes public education what it is for our children. They need to see the world as it really is. The world is not all white males. It's not all white females. And the rest of us have kind of come along and become a part of it. And we've made a difference. So I, I think that uh, from what I have seen about Gifford County and the leadership of Gifford County through our superintendents is that they've tried really, really hard to make sure that we represent uh, a high level of diversity at every level. Uh, and so that's a good thing for our, our kids. Plus, if you work in a, in a school community, you learn things. So it's not just the children that learn. Staff learn from each other. And so it's a good, healthy thing that sometimes, depending if you don't push it too hard, that you, you, you know, as a staff person, you get a chance to meet and talk with somebody that is not a part of your norm in your life because they don't live in your neighborhood. You didn't go to school with them. And we bring that into that education and learning environment and that's healthy so that's my point about that um i want to uh, let you know that the page um uh, learn to swim will start again next week so if any of y'all want to put on your swimming trunks and come and help us teach these uh, uh teenagers to learn to swim it, uh, that starts next week and i can give you the schedule i'm very happy to see that because because of COVID. We had, uh, you know, uh, had to put it off, and so uh, they've asked me to come. So I guess I'll be in the pool next week. Um, for um, ne next Monday is, is MLK Day, and um, I just want to say um, I don't seek awards. I never have, and I'm very uh, humbled and thankful that the city of Greensboro uh, chose to particularly this award because because of what it's named, the Everyday People Award, because I'm for the everyday people. And so I, I thank all of you for tolerating uh, me and my idiosyncrasies. And, and, you know, sometimes I realize I, you know, push hard for some things, but it's because of who we serve. It's not about us. And, and I, I just want the community to know that I've been an old soldier out here for a long, long time. And maybe it's because I turned 70 last uh, October that they decided, well, we better go ahead and give her flowers because she might not be around too much longer. But I am grateful that, you know, all of the work, for those of you who have known me a very, very long time, that I I've been out here on this battlefield a long time. And so I I'm, I'm grateful uh, that folks have decided that I'm worthy because uh, I do what I do for the person who sent me. And then um, February is Black History Month. And the theme for this year, and every year, Carter G. Wilson Association does create a theme for Black History Month. And this year's theme is Black Resistance. And I encourage folk to go on the uh, Asala's website 
and look up what that means because I find this thing particularly exciting because there is res black resistance in every way, walk of life, whether it's religious, whether it's education, whether it's um, food. We, we, we resisted in order to be a part of this, uh, this world and this society. Uh, and it's been a good thing. So uh, if you, if you want to know more about the theme, uh, I, I think I, didn't I send you my paper on that, uh, Dr. Oakley? So, uh, you know, all of us can, can, can appreciate the struggle of being who we are uh, in, in America. Uh, thank you very much and Happy New Year to everybody. Thank you, Ms. Pratt. I wanted to circle back to the last board meeting that we had real quickly. We had some discussion from the nutrition department about the lunches that are provided for students who have negative balances or don't have the money for lunch. Um, and I wanted to just request that the nutrition department think about trying to find a way to include protein in those lunches that is lacking from those meals. We have a lot of students with hunger and poverty issues, and we all know that students need to be well fed to be successful, and having protein is an important part of that. Um, so I just wanted to encourage that. Um, on the consent agenda, we had a whole bunch of financial things related to monies from the 2020 bond and increases to those project costs. I understand, of course, that there have been rising construction costs and supply chain issues. We've got you know, all sorts of things that are affecting those costs, but some of those cost increases are very, very significant. Um, I know that that money is in the process of being spent and those projects are already, you know, that's a train that's already going down the tracks, so to speak. Um, but we also certainly as a board do have a responsibility to the taxpayers to make sure that we're managing their funds appropriately. And so as we begin really looking at the projects for the bond that was just passed, the 1.7 billion, I hope that we'll be working to try to find as many efficiencies as we can and try to figure out ways to rein in some of those costs. Um, also, I, I do wanna speak to the vacancy in District 3 as well. Um, obviously, the constituents of District 3 deserve to have some representation, and I hope that when this issue comes up at the next meeting that we're able to get some sort of resolution on this topic so that we can move forward and be sure that all of the students in Guilford County and all the families are being appropriately represented on the board. And then my final thing, I'm in the process of scheduling school visits with all the schools in District 2, and I'm super excited about that. I've got two this week and a couple coming up next week. So I'm really excited to get into the school buildings, be able to talk with the school leaders one-on-one, -on -one, find out exactly what their needs are and what's going well in their schools, and get to visit some of the classrooms and kids. So thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. Well, I hope everybody had a wonderful holiday, and um, I'm happy to have everybody back. I heard that from some teachers that that two weeks off re-energized them, so, and probably all staff got a little re-energized so that we can work hard to get have a, a good start to 2023. Um, I want to do a big shout out to our maintenance crew who have had a huge toll to pull. Um, you know, I know we don't have enough of them to stretch, I know they're doing very, you know, trying their best to get everybody back up after the over 50 schools went, had some major situations going on. So I do want to give them a big shout out that we see you, we appreciate you. And, um, you know, I just want to make sure that we say that. Um, for Michael Logan, I'm going to say, I appreciate your 25 years. And, um, you know, I, I believe your students have appreciated you and respect you for the great work that you have done over those 25 years. Um, so, and then I am also on board with uh, Chrissy's comments that the current projects are going. Um, we have seen a major increase, which they're again cutting into the funds that will, we're supposed to, you know, afford all the, um, I don't know how many projects, you know, every school something, all right? Well, 
that's going to be a challenge when we're running 50%, you know, twice as much on every project right now. So um, I'm hoping the economy kind of gets back under control and we don't have that going on, but I do. And I am, I mean, it was actually 58 schools that got caught in the um, cold weather and rain and all that. And that means we need to focus on getting some of these schools to a certain level of maintenance, which was promised in this bond. Um, I also want to say I'm very sorry to the families that have lost so much at such a, you know, so I'm sorry, I'm praying for you. And uh, that's all I'll say, thank you. Thank you, Alan. Well, thank you so much. And Linda, that poignant reminder I echo, um, we feel this loss, these losses deeply as a community and thank you for reminding us of that. Um, there's nothing more important to say in this meeting than the value of those lives and um, we hold them in our hearts. Uh, I would like to also say that between your first meeting and your second meeting as a new member of this board, <laughs> you get your committee assignments. And so my thanks, uh, Madam Chairwoman, for those appointments, which include the facilities committee, uh, which means that I have now sat in the joint capital and facilities meeting with our county commissioner representatives as well. Uh, and I have to tell you, it was a meeting full of uh, overwhelming information. <laughs> Uh, including all of uh, the rising costs that we have observed and that we are all concerned about. Uh, but I will say that my largest takeaway from the, the breadth of that meeting was the exceptional work that has been done by Michelle Reed and her team uh, to amidst the realities of uh, inflation and supply chain issues and all brought on by the pandemic have worked so hard to do all that can be done to cut costs to save where we can and uh, to maintain the values that govern these projects and give us such bright hope for the future. So I'm grateful to Michelle and the team who are doing that work and have confidence in your ability uh, to do that moving forward and our support of that work. Um, the last thing I would like to say is to mention again the name Jericho Carrillo. Uh, Jericho is uh, our Rookie Teacher of the Year here in Guilford County and as Dr. Oakley mentioned um, is the a uh, finalist for state for the beginning teacher of the year in the state of North Carolina. And he's also a personal friend of mine uh, whom I love and value. Uh, and I met him several years ago when he was a student at UNCG. And one Sunday morning, uh, this new flautist, flutist, however we pronounce that, uh, played a breathtaking and stirring piece in a worship service. Um, the next day was Monday, and there was some buzz in Greensboro that day. Some of you will remember it was the day where we were visited in our community by uh, the Westboro Baptist Church, which doesn't deserve much of our energy except to summarize and say this is a fiercely anti-LGBTQ, bigoted, hateful uh, group that visits um, campuses and seeks to create a stir. Um, also a group that gives me the chance to, to um, say that there are a lot of different kinds of Baptist churches out there. It's just a good thing to note. Um, but they were visiting Greensboro and uh, went to Guilford College and UNCG. And of course, Greensboro's response was to uh, joyfully counter that in every way that we knew how. And so many of us were at Guilford College for their first visit. And then we made our way to UNCG. And as I walked towards the campus to join this group counter protesting, uh, I heard the noise of a pep band, brass ringing out. And there in the middle of the pep band, I saw uh, the flautist from the church service playing a trumpet uh, leading the pep band. Um, and I thought to myself, wow, what a range of skill. But even more than that, um, to go from playing the flute in an uh, um, inspiring worship service um, to be leading the counter protest pep band um, was to me also a range of commitment and values um, that I see and celebrate in Jericho because it's not merely about our skills, our experience, our commitment, uh, our dedication. It is also about um, what we put those things in service to uh, and putting those things in service to uh, all of humanity, 
and common good and justice for all people. And I want to celebrate my friend who does this and to celebrate the fact that that kind of commitment is repeated again and again by our educators in so many places and in so many ways and it inspires us uh, to be about that same work as well. Thank you, Betty. Thank you. Again, Happy New Year to you. Um, as you know, um, MLK Day is a day of service and I challenge all the board members to do something as far as serving the community. And I challenge everyone, um, even the students, because students, you can receive service learning hours. So find your nonprofit organization and provide some service. You have no idea how much that would mean um, to other people. I'd like to thank Calvary Baptist Church, Reverend Vince Harrison, for your dedication to one of my schools um, as far as providing food, toys, games, and et cetera. Also, Danny Brown with United Maintenance um, Group for providing dinner, turkeys, hams, and so forth to another one of my school. I'm not gonna call the school name because I don't want anybody to get jealous. And um, the last but not least, um, Deliverance Temple Worship Center. And you know it's cold outside, so they provided coats and hats and gloves to one of my schools. I did a um, board member Pratt about the nutrition. Um, we will definitely be on the same accord on that one because um, the alternative meal, I hope that we will find something different um, in the next few meetings. To all the employees of Gifford County Schools, whether you are classified or certified employee, I thank you very much for all the hard work you have done, not only the Monday through Friday, but also the Saturdays and Sunday. And thank you for all you do for our children. Thank you. Thank you. Kim? Yeah. I'll come back and do her. Uh, yes, Happy New Year to everyone. Um, I'm glad that we're back. And I just want to say that I have a new commitment to this work and to this role in serving as a school board member and representing uh, District 6. I have a new, you know, just a new energy about parent engagement, student empowerment, and truly ending the school to prison pipeline. Um, we have a lot of work to do. Um, around schools and education and thinking about schools a new way and how we're going to go forward and push through some things. Um, MLK Day, yes, is a day of service, um, but that's not the only day. Of course, we know people serve. Um, we should be about service all the time, um, just not on MLK Day. Um, Cause I'm grateful to the, uh, Jen to Jenny Cavanis who is the community engagement director that organized the uh, Yuletide program that I was able to participate in. And I was fortunate enough to meet her today finally um, and attend the swearing in ceremony of uh, John Thompson, our new chief of police for the city of Greensboro. And I am concerned about the fact that we have no resolution in regard to the district three um, placement and I do think as a board we have to think differently about this work and the representation that does matter um, and people do deserve like an answer from us of why we are not seating um, who is being recommended by the Republican Party um, we, we have to think about that because I do remember the incident um, with Winston and she was a Democrat um, and what happened and there was a resolution um, to that. And finally, um, I want us to think about some undoing racism work for this board in particular. I do think that that's some work that we need to bring to this board and see how we can get that done. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Begin by um, building off of Kim and Betty's statements about supporting our staff and um, uh, working towards resolution with the uh, District 3 seat. 
I've already had some concerns come across my plate in just this short time regarding Linda Wellborn's comment or statement, and I quote, I don't think he has any complaints in his personnel file speaking regarding Michael Logan. I would like to reassure our employees that we as board members cannot, whenever we feel, go picking through their personnel files. This statement is very disingenuous and is misrepresentative of what authority we have as board members. I don't know why uh, that that statement, I don't think he has any complaints in his personnel file, was appropriate. Uh, because the other problem is, is that we are legally not allowed to discuss personnel files. They are of the utmost confidentiality, and that is for the employee's protection. So I'd like to once again let our employees know this is not something we do. We do not go picking through your personnel files. And to put that statement out there, um, I think was very, very misleading. And I understand that it was in support of Mr. Logan, uh, but still not something that is within our authority to do also the statement why is this man not fired and you know so i believe it was um mrs bellamy small earlier that said we allow everyone to have their opinions if he has had disciplinary action for those opinions or for something said in the classroom that would be in that personnel file that we do not look at so those statements in, are there again very disingenuous and i don't believe very supportive of mr logan's position at all and disturbing to me on a portional level because i'm concerned that it speaks to abuse of authority if his personal file has been violated other than that i would like to wish everyone a time of consideration for black history month and particularly for dr martin luther king jr's birthday and um that probably is my biggest time for this month and make it a point to stop and revisit his work, revisit the works of authors like Maya Angelou, who speaks so deeply to the human experience that I support with my whole heart and my caring and providing nursing care, and also to stop and look at the professional world around me and question my own practice, my own thought processes, and my own perceptions of the people in my world to make sure that as I provide care, I do it with dignity for everyone, and I would like to encourage all to do the same. Thank you. I want to respond you. to that Linda. because number one, I was not implying that we looked into any personnel files. I'm just asking. You I am saying that. that the man has a 25 year career that should, then people are up here trying to make him look like a monster. And I have a problem with that. And so that was my point. No, we do not look in personnel files. But I thought he was, uh, he could not have, he did not have a right to defend himself against those allegations. And I could not sit here and let people, this man had a 25 year career, whether we agree with his personal Facebook or his positions as a politician, a lot of, you know, that's been going on for a long time. But Linda, this is out of order. Well, I, I know it's out of order. respect our process. Every board member had an opportunity to say what they needed to say. You can address this at the next board meeting in your public comments. But well, we don't follow up. After I, I rarely board. go out and do this. But to be called out that way, I had a problem with it. And I have a problem with a 25-year veteran, whether you agree with him politically or not, being kind of like, presented as this horrible individual and with no defense. So that was my point. The public has the right, as board members have the right, to ex to make comments. And we have, if we have heard from uh, a, a diversity of, of, of experiences and perceptions of people out there. I'm just saying that you're out of order. I'm out of order and I appreciate that, but board I, member I felt. All right. Um, I also would like to offer my condolences um, to the family in, in High Point. The tragic loss of, of, of children and just human life period is sometimes incomprehensible. We've also lost the lives of other students tragically. Um, and the loss of, of any human being is, is disheartening. Um, but those that die tragically at the hands of other people um, because of, of, of mental illness or even at their own hands, um, 
is it particularly frustrating because you just feel like there was something that could have been done that that was avoidable so definitely hearts and prayers are with people i am always grateful for our staff i i uh, the thing i dislike most is the way that we devalue this work um, and this system in education and everyone in it. I get to interact with bus drivers the most because my front yard is a bus stop on, on both sides. It's the morning, it's, it's, uh, it's Kaiser, it's Lindley, it's Grimsley uh, in, in my neighborhood. So I get to see bus drivers a lot. And um, I just can't imagine um, you know, all of the work that people do and, and not that this board uh, or individuals, but that as a country and as a culture, we do not value this profession. Um, and and I, I hope that that's a, a legacy of ours before this is over, that we, we lift it up um, and, and put it where it should be. Um, someone left this book for me. I don't know who it was, but you can confess. It just says, a white-collar profession, African-American certified public accountant since 1921. So thank you so much. I was just thumbing through a couple of it. And as we're kicking off the Hub Advisory Committee um, to help support and um, inform our um, decisions and um, and partnerships. Um, I just want to read the first paragraph of this book because I think context and history is really important. Why do we have to have a historically underutilized business? Why were businesses historically underutilized? Were they not interested? Did they just not go to the right school? But I just want to read a little bit and I'll close. It says, when Theodora Fontenot Rutherford graduated summa cum laude from Howard University in 1923, so this is 2023, this is 100 years ago, she dreamed of becoming a certified public accountant. Her favorite accounting professor had encouraged the talented 19-year-old to strive for the pinnacle of the accounting profession, providing her with questions from prior CPA examinations to help her prepare. She earned a scholarship to Columbia University's Graduate School of Business, and she hoped that New York would provide opportunities that had been unavailable because of race and the southern states in which she had been raised. Although she was bright, well-educated, hardworking, and determined, Rutherford was prevented from achieving her goal for the next 37 years when she finally became a CPA in 1960. And she graduated in 1923, but became a CPA in 1960. She was only one of a few dozen African-American CPAs in the entire country. And I remember asking Angie and Sharon Osmond and our finance uh, chief financial officers, um, do we have any diversity of accounting firms that we can partner with. And there aren't any that have had the access and the experience to fulfill a contract. And it's not because they weren't smart and hardworking and, um, and dreamed of being in that profession. It was because they were prevented. So we are dealing with the history of those decisions and that exclusion. And this is gonna come up over and over because some people say, why do we have to consider that? Well, this is why. Because decisions were made that people were excluded from opportunities because of the color of their skin. I've shared the story of J.B. Jeffries, who was a black contractor, that the city awarded a contract to build a white elementary school off of West Lee Street in 1912. And uh, white contractors whose contracts were twice as much as his bid were upset that he was getting the contract because he was black and the contract was, was rescinded because of race. So we have a, a race-based problem and race-neutral solutions cannot fix that and correct it so that we can level the playing field so that people will be able to be chosen and decisions made based on merit and not based on trying to correct these incredible glacial inequities of the past. So, um, those are my comments, and I will entertain a motion, motion to, adjourn. to adjourn. Is there a second? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Yeah.